Hi LEGO fans, it's time for another classic LEGO Harry Potter set review and I must not tell lies, this one is super special. LEGO released only one Harry Potter set in 2007 and we're going to review this valuable set in a secure, risk-free way. Today I'm going to be reviewing set number 5378, the third edition Order of the Phoenix themed Hogwarts castle from LEGO Harry Potter. Along the way we're going to be checking out the mandrakes in Professor Sprout's greenhouse, trying out for a place in Dumbledore's army. Some of us with certain life experiences will have the opportunity to admire the Thestrals. Hopefully we can avoid getting some lines as we check out Professor Umbridge's office. And to wrap up the video we'll be checking out more than $180 of rare and collectible Harry Potter minifigures. At the time of filming there have been five Lego Harry Potter sets titled Hogwarts Castle. It all started in 2001 with the Philosopher's Stone themed 4709 Hogwarts Castle. The second edition came in 2004 themed on the Prisoner of Azkaban and was followed by this, the third edition in 2007. The well respected 4842 Hogwarts Castle was released in 2010 and then there was a gap of 8 years before the magnificent 6020 piece 71043 set which came out in 2018. So what's so special about this third edition of Hogwarts Castle? Firstly this was the only LEGO Harry Potter release of 2007 unless you count a few measly keychains. Secondly this was a relatively expensive set at 70 Great British Pounds or 90 US Dollars. Mint in box today this sells for $523 and even in used condition like this it's worth around $342. More than half the value of this set comes from the minifigures and we get 9 of those in this 943 piece treasure trove of Harry Potter goodness. First up we get the HP061 Rubius Hagrid who's worth about $11. You'll also find him in the 4754 Hagrid's Hut set from 2004. Next we have the HP064 Ron Weasley with the sleeping and awake face. He sells for about $9, can also be found in the 472 Rescue from the Mer People set and was included as a bonus target exclusive minifigure in the 4768 Durmstrang ship. Next is the HP072 variant of Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore. He sells for about $11 and also came in the 4767 Harry and the Hungarian Horntail set. As well as that he was also a target exclusive minifigure with the 4768 Durmstrang ship. And then we come to the pinnacle of LEGO Harry Potter minifigure collecting. This is the HP080 Professor Dolores Umbridge who is an exclusive to this set. She resells for an eye-watering $82. The next minifigure, the HP081 Death Eater is also exclusive and resells for about $9. This rather unusual looking version of Professor Severus Snape is the HP082 variant. He's exclusive to this set and is worth about $37. The HP083 Hermione Granger in her Gryffindor uniform is another exclusive and she resells for about $10. The same resale value applies to the HP085 Draco Malfoy with this ridiculous smirk. Finally for this star studded lineup we have the HP086 Harry Potter. He's another exclusive to this set and he holds his value at $15. Six of the nine minifigures from this set are exclusives which helps to make it really valuable. The 9 minifigures alone have a value of about $184. This set is in great shape so we're not going to do a teardown and rebuild today. Instead let's just get on with the review. When it comes to LEGO Harry Potter sets depicting Hogwarts Castle we really are spoilt for choice. It's not nearly so impressive as the 71043 microscale Bayamoth, but considering this has 5000 less pieces it's actually a really good looking set. The main bulk of the build is contained in this multi-story tower. We also have a smaller annex tower and Professor Pomona Sprout's greenhouse where the students take herbology lessons. This set looks good not only from the outside but also from the inside with some really cool details. We're going to start by taking a look at the main castle, then we'll have a poke around inside the annex, see how the latest crop of mandrakes are coming along and then we'll take a look at those wallet busting minifigures. So this is the biggest part of the build and I think it's meant to represent the main entrance to Hogwarts Castle. I think this opens up onto the courtyard where Dolores Umbridge was seen to be banishing Sybil Trelawney from Hogwarts. Although this is quite a bulky part of the build it actually closes up to give it a really neat footprint. Spinning it around you can actually see this comes together very neatly. Although this has a lot of grey bricks towards the bottom we do have the more traditional tan and tan green towards the top. 
This colour scheme was used on most of the Hogwarts builds until around 2018. The front door isn't quite as imposing as the large double doors that Dumbledore burst through in the Order of the Phoenix. Instead we've got a large pale grey element with a brown door set into it. Given that Mr Filch is a squib and he can't use Lumos to see what he's doing, we do have a couple of torches to help him find his keys. Above the imposing front door you will find the Hogwarts motto. My Latin isn't very good but here goes. Draco Dormians Nunquam Titilandus. This translates in English to never tickle a sleeping dragon. Also never let kids apply stickers because this is clearly not on straight. On either side of the Hogwarts motto you'll find these decorative lion's heads. These are really nice elements that have been used in a variety of themes including Nexo Knight, Legends of Chima and even one of the Avatar sets. As we move further up the build we have a really nice stained glass window with these trans blue and trans orange bricks and then these corner turrets which are actually mounted on turntables. It's a slightly odd design choice but you'll notice the wings on either side of the castle are actually exposed. There's no facing on the front and you can actually see through to the inside. The same goes for the other side where you can actually see the back of the fireplace inside the Gryffindor common room. At roof level you'll find a number of turrets which give this the definitive Lego Hogwarts look. We even have a lonely bat perched up on top and defensive crenellations along the roof line. Crenellations are the up and down bits you find on top of a castle. Before this turns into a full on architecture lesson I think we should spin this around and take a look at the interior. There you go. There are basically three levels of accommodation inside the 5378 Hogwarts castle and we're going to start down in the entrance hall. The entrance hall is a little on the bare side but what we do find in here is very nice indeed. You can see the back of the panel to which the door is clipped. This and the door are quite old elements but really do suit this build. Hidden away above the door you'll find a really fancy pair of axes. This colour is quite unusual and shows silver speckles on a black background. We also have a wall mounted torch complete with trans orange flame element and a suit of armour which I think represents one of the statues inside the entrance hall. You might recall in Deathly Hallows Part 2 there was a spell that Professor McGonagall always wanted to use. Pietotum Locomotor! Ok this guy isn't coming to life anytime soon but he can be removed from this plinth. The choice of element for the legs is unusual to say the least and I'm pretty sure those are lightsaber elements. This little armoured chappy also hides a secret. This is a dark bluish grey tile 1x2 with Elder Futhark runes pattern. I'm not entirely sure what the significance is but this does seem to be an exclusive tile for this set. To the left hand side of the entrance hall you'll find this cosy fire. Now I know for certain that the Gryffindor common room isn't here but I think this might be the fire from that common room. The middle two flames are actually mounted on a flap and if we push that back it reveals a face within the fireplace. It's not the easiest thing in the world to see and again the stickering isn't very good but you can actually see Sirius Black's face within the fire. Above the fire, taking advantage of the height of this room, you'll also find a decorative chimney breast. Following the symmetry of this build let's scooch on over to the other side. This room over on the right hand side looks really interesting but I'm not going to lie those pillars really do get in the way. Ok I think we just about got away with that. In fact it's easier just to remove the whole thing and rely on the spell Repero. Ah yes but I'm not a wizard, oh dang. Anyhow I'm not certain whose office this is but I've got a sneaky suspicion it may be Snape's. Interesting artifacts include this skull within a glass dome, a delightful trans blue goblet, I don't think I've got one in that colour, and the death ray the Emperor from Star Wars uses. I'm sure in reality this is a magical flame. Over in the back of the office we have this trans clear post box and inside we can find some kind of letter. There's also a trans red cone sitting on top which I'm just going to have to assume is some kind of potions bottle. Mounted in the ceiling is what looks like another chimney but I guess this could be an extraction hood for potion making. Up on the next level we have a lot of cool stuff including the most terrifying teacher's office I've ever seen so let's get in there and check it out. I don't know whether this belongs to one of the teachers or whether it's representative of one of the Slytherin dormitories. Certainly I'd expect those to be in the basement. You'll notice a strange blue thing sticking out from under the bed and if we turn it around you'll also notice a red thing sticking out of the other end. In fact if we give the blue thing a bit of a prod it reveals a red book hidden underneath the bed. I can't imagine what kind of book Draco Malfoy might be hiding under there. 
I was hoping to find something cool inside the book, but I think it might be empty. Let's just take a look. Yeah, it's an empty book. I'm presuming this room in the middle must be the Hogwarts trophy room. Here we find all kinds of shiny stuff and some really nice elements. In the corner we have a trans blue crystal hidden inside a display case. There's a gold platter bearing the house crest of Gryffindor. And red and blue rosettes which come from the Lego Scala range. There's another chalice, this time in a bottle green colour. And a rather nice pearlescent gold bottle. In fact there are four similar pieces in this build including one we'll see in Professor Umbridge's office. These originally came on a piece of sprue and they're very expensive to replace. The other thing which I've lifted out to make it easier to look at is this treasure chest which includes a Quidditch set. More accurately I think we've got a quaffle and a pair of bludgers but sadly no golden snitch. Moving along to the final room on this floor we have the office of Dolores Jane Umbridge. She was senior under secretary to the Minister for Magic, Defence Against the Dark Arts Professor, Hogwarts High Inquisitor, Briefly Headmistress, and she'll ever more be known as a foul evil gargoyle. Exactly as we saw in the movie we have decorative plates on the wall depicting cute kittens and cats. Her desk is covered in objects which reflect her favourite colour pink. The only exception is the atomizer, which is the fourth pearl gold atomizer from the Scala Sprue. Professor Umbridge is very generous and always has a fresh supply of quills for her students to use. I was looking for the inkwell but apparently there isn't one and we won't need any ink. She also often invites students in for a cup of tea or coffee but you may want to decline the Veritaserum flavoured coffee creamer. One little detail I really do like is the purple lamp in the corner of the office. Dolores really does have a good taste in interior design. It's also a practical place with plenty of storage. In fact if you flip down this decorative scroll, there's a really useful place here for storing contraband. Inside the cupboard you'll find Harry's Firebolt which was a Christmas gift from his godfather Sirius Black. I'm not sure if this actually happened in the movie but Professor Umbridge confiscated it when Harry was banned from Quidditch. This has to be my favourite part of the build and I really love the Order of the Phoenix movie. Dolores Umbridge is such a fantastically horrible villain. Hit him! Uh, I'm sorry Professor Umbridge, I won't tell lies again. At the very top of the main building is what I presume is meant to be the astronomy tower. Here we have quite a neat telescope build which incorporates a ship's sextant. We also have a star chart which includes at least one recognisable constellation. I definitely recognise the plough or as some people call it the Big Dipper. It certainly looks like a fancy telescope but I imagine those crisscross shutters are going to get in the way. There is some attic space way up on top which is empty but it would have been a really cool place to put something like the mirror of Erised. While it's not perfect I think the designers did a good job with this interior, especially the trophy room and also the office of Dolores Jane Umbridge. Before we move on to the other parts of the castle, Harry wants to demonstrate some equipment he uses to train Dumbledore's army. Expelliarmus! It's a fun interactive feature that allows students to practice dueling in a secure, risk-free way. Stupefy! It really is a super simple feature and when you turn the minifigure it allows the target to fall over. After the excitement of the main building we get this tower which looks a little bit like a church. It has the familiar tan and tan green colour scheme, more of those crenellations, and up on the rooftop we have this rat which is standing up on its hind feet. This element was specifically made for set number 4756, the Shrieking Shack, and this is indeed Scabbers the Rat or Peter Pettigrew. Now last time I watched The Order of the Phoenix, which was exactly yesterday in preparation for this video, neither Peter Pettigrew, Scabbers or Wormtail appeared in this movie. There are a couple of hinges in the far end of the build and the whole thing neatly unfolds. One really neat feature about this tower is the way the turret opens up and then comes back together. The flappy bit here doesn't seem quite as well thought through, it doesn't really close and it stops the whole thing from opening up correctly. It kind of comes in useful when you set this at a right angle but doesn't seem particularly well thought through. Because this set was released about 13 years ago I don't have Lego's notes to explain what everything does. This part of the interior is less well decorated and I'm just going to have to take a guess as to what this might be. There are some decorative wall hangings which bear the Hogwarts crest. I'm guessing this isn't any of the common rooms. Given that we have a lot of space to move around in, I'm guessing this is going to be the room of requirement, which is the perfect place to train Dumbledore's army. On the floor above there's a place to hang out and have a heart to heart, but sadly there's no mistletoe. 
On the other side we have this thing which is a bit of an enigma. I did think this might be a vanishing cabinet, but that doesn't come about until Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. I was also curious about these 1x4 printed tiles. These were actually created for the Vikings range in 2006, and were also used again in the 10185 Greengrocer modular building. In other words, I don't think they have anything to do with Harry Potter. What you will notice is that this has a bunch of wands attached to each of the corners in all different colours. So I'm thinking this is just another training prop for Dumbledore's army. So far there's not a lot to see, but if you keep looking up and up, we do have some feathered friends in the attic. On the left hand side there's a white owl who looks rather a lot like Hedwig. On the other side we have pretty much the same thing, except it's a black owl element. Woohoo! This part of the castle is much more disappointing than the other. I totally get that you can use this space to train Dumbledore's army. With only Harry, Ron and Hermione in the minifigure roster, there really isn't enough scope to do that. Thankfully we have something more exciting to move on to. It's the Herbology Greenhouse. The sides are made up of grey panels and then as you'd expect some large windows. In fact the roof is completely transparent to let plenty of light in for our special fauna. There is a brown door to allow students inside, but thankfully for us there is a far easier option. The whole thing opens up, revealing the plant life within. Inside you're going to find a good amount of potted plants and greenery. There are also these things that look like toadstools, and a blackboard on which I think Professor Sprout has written her lesson notes. You may want to put your ear defenders on because today's lesson is all about mandrakes. A mandrake is actually the root of a plant from the genus Mandragora. According to ancient folklore, the mandrake root would scream and cry as it was pulled from the ground, killing anyone who heard it. Although it looks quite different to the mandrakes we saw in the Harry Potter movies, this really does make me smile, it's such a cool element. Although it was great to get Professor Sprout's greenhouse in this 2007 set, we actually had to wait until 2011 and the 4867 Hogwarts set to get a minifigure. We'll be taking a look at all of the minifigures from this set in just a moment, but before then it's time for some of us to take a look at the Thestrals. Well after that enlightening class about mandrakes, it's time to move on to Care of Magical Creatures. Now listen up children, today we're going to be learning about Thestrals. The really nice thing about this set is that we get not one, but two of these fantastic Thestrals. Technically Thestrals can only be seen by people who've seen death. I imagine all of us saw the Goblet of Fire movie, so we should be good here. I also saw the Crimes of Grindelwald, which died a horrible death. Thestrals are a breed of winged horse with a skeletal body, face with reptilian features, and wide leathery wings that resemble a bat. They're native to the British Isles, but can sometimes also be seen in Europe. Thestrals are actually made of five different Lego elements. There's a skeletal body, which was also used in the popular Monster Fighters range and a couple of clip elements to attach the wings. These are actually dragon's wings and can be seen in earlier Lego sets. Thestrals are used at Hogwarts to pull the seemingly horseless carriages. These in turn are used to transport the older students from Hogsmeade Railway Station up to Hogwarts School. Lego made a new version of the Thestral for 75951 Grindelwald's Escape from 2018. It's a little bit bigger than the Thestrals we get inside this set, and I've got to be honest, I think I prefer the older one. What do you guys think? There's no doubt about it, this is a very expensive Lego set. A good chunk of that value comes down to the inclusion of no less than 9 minifigures. In fact, one of these minifigures alone makes up about 20% of the resale value of this set. Let's take a closer look and see why these guys are so special. First up we have the three Gryffindor students, Ron Weasley, Harry Potter and Hermione Granger. I've bought these three together because the legs and the torsos are the same for each character. They each have plain dark grey legs and then a Gryffindor school uniform torso print. This shows each of them wearing a white shirt with Gryffindor tie, grey school jumper and golden red detail complete with some metallic printing. For these earlier versions we don't have any printing on the back. This version of Harry is exclusive to the 5378 Hogwarts Castle and he's worth about $15. I actually had a hard time believing that this Harry was exclusive. To me he looks just like the very common Harry Potter minifigure we got in later sets. Comparing the 2007 Harry Potter on the left to the 2011 version on the right, you'll notice he's quite different. The later version uses black legs, a different torso print and a slightly different facial print. It also has printing around the back which is missing from the earlier version. 
Although the hair mold isn't unique, the facial print certainly is. It's unmistakably Harry Potter and includes his trademark glasses and lightning shaped scar. An easy way to verify the head is correct is to turn it around. I think pretty much all of the later Harry Potter minifigures have a secondary expression. Ron Weasley appears in two other sets and that makes him less collectible. He has a retail value of about $12. I don't know what happened to the facial print, but Ron has a face only a mother could love. What's with that weird smile? The alternate expression shows Ron asleep at the bottom of the Great Lake. This was used in the 4762 Rescue from the Mer People set from 2005. The Hermione minifigure is a bit of an odd one. She is exclusive to this set, but she's only worth about $10. The reason for that is that she's almost identical to the minifigure used in the 4762 Rescue from the Mer People set. All we have is a fancy new haircut, and the new hair that you see on the right here is used on a bunch of future Hermione minifigures. So she's actually really easy to put back together from a bunch of spare parts. Next we have the boy everybody loves to hate, Draco Malfoy. He's wearing the same dark grey pants but has a Slytherin coloured sweater. You'll notice some green and some really nice metallic silver. From that point it all goes a bit downhill. I mean what on earth is going on with Draco's face? Yes he's meant to have some kind of sneer but this is just a cheesy grin. The hair is also a bit of an odd choice and doesn't really help to make this look like Malfoy. Draco Malfoy is an exclusive to this set and I imagine Lego broke the mould after they made this one. He's not worth a fortune but has a resale value of about $10. Staying with the Slytherin theme we have the head of Slytherin house, Professor Severus Snape. This is the second most valuable minifigure from this set thanks to the exclusive face and the exclusive torso. The hair is much more widely used and appears on about 127 minifigures. There's nothing remotely unique about the legs, but we do have this really nice torso print. It shows the tightly buttoned jacket that Snape wears, outlined in purple. Snape also has a standard minifigure cape in this black colour. But the really interesting thing is the facial print, which is quite different to any of the other Snape minifigures. Removing the hairpiece, you can see we've got more printed hair coming down over Snape's face. It's actually a really nice print and reminds me a lot of Alan Rickman, God bless his soul. I wasn't too sure about this minifigure at first, but it's actually grown on me a lot. In fact, I think this is now my favourite Snape minifigure. He's also my most valuable Snape minifigure and he's worth about $37. Professor Albus Dumbledore, Order of Merlin First Class is slightly less valuable. His value is about $11 and he also appears in two other sets. Here we see Dumbledore dressed in sand blue robes with plain sand blue legs. There is some really nice torso printing, but it's hidden away underneath that beard. Hang on just a sec. Dumbledore didn't really want to shave, but you've got to do what you've got to do. As you can see, we've got a really nice torso print here with some rather nice metallic printing. It also gives us a chance to take a look at the facial expression with the half moon spectacles. It's really nicely printed, but without the beard, he looks a little bit like Benjamin Franklin. The beard is a really nice element and also incorporates side whiskers. I really like the way this comes together with the hair. Incidentally, I'm pretty sure that Lucius Malfoy has the same hair, but in blonde. Next we come to what must be the holy grail of LEGO Harry Potter minifigure collecting. This is Professor Dolores Umbridge. Until 2018, she was the only Dolores Umbridge minifigure. With an exclusive facial print and exclusive torso, she's worth a whopping $82. There is another Dolores Umbridge minifigure, and that came in the 5005254 Harry Potter minifigure collection from 2018. That's also quite the collectible thing, but not nearly as collectible as this one. There is also a nanoscale version of Dolores, which comes with the 71043 Hogwarts Castle from 2018. The colour choice of this minifigure is perfect, and I love the cat brooch print on the torso. The facial print is an absolute masterpiece and captures the toad-like features of Dolores Umbridge perfectly. I really like the over-applied blusher on the cheeks, it's awesome. But my favourite part of the face is the eyes which seem to literally burrow into your soul. The other thing that helps to keep the resale value of Dolores Umbridge really high is that hair. This has only ever been used on two minifigures and it makes it a very expensive part. Dolores Jane Umbridge is a fantastic minifigure and makes this set very desirable. But I'm curious to know what you think. Would you pay upwards of $80 for a minifigure or has the world lost its mind? As always, please feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments section below and I'll reply to as many as I can. 
Next we have a generic Death Eater, which is an unusual choice for a Hogwarts castle set. Unless I've missed something, these guys don't make an entrance until the end of the movie. The legs are standard black minifigure legs, and then we have a basic black torso with grey hands. There's also a pretty common black cape, and a hood which makes an appearance in about 92 different Lego sets. The Death Eater is worth around $9, and only holds that value for one reason. The minifigure head is exclusive to this set, and shows an ornate Death Eater mask. There's no doubt this is a very cool minifigure, but the use of generic parts does bring down the value. Finally for minifigures, we have what is, I guess, technically not a minifigure. This is the irrepressibly lovable Rubius Hagrid. The Hagrid figure isn't quite as tall as he is described in the book, nor as tall as he is shown in the movie. As you can see here, he's only about a head higher than Hermione. This version with the reddish brown top coat is worth about $11, and also appeared in the 4754 Hagrid's Hut from 2004. Unlike later versions, the feet are actually moulded into the body. In fact, the only pieces you should ever attempt to remove are the head and the beard piece. In fact, without the hair and beard, he looks pretty strange. Replace the hair, and we have the Hagrid we know and love. The arms are poseable, but the really interesting thing are those moulded fingers. The hands work just like any other minifigure, but the fingers really add an extra dimension. There is a really nice torso print showing the layers of Hagrid's clothing, and also a metallic belt buckle. No printing around the back, but you can see details such as the moulded pockets on either side, and you'll also notice a tab between the shoulder blades which helps the two halves of Hagrid snap together. This really is a nice version of the Hagrid figure, and it's good to know those Thestrals are going to be in very good hands. And just in case the Thestrals decide not to behave, Hagrid does have a backup plan. This set really does have a super nice collection of minifigures. With so many rare and desirable characters, the total value of these minifigures tops out at about $184. So that was set number 5378, the magnificent Hogwarts Castle from LEGO Harry Potter! I've been looking for a good example of this set with all of the minifigures for ages, so I'm super stoked to be able to add this to my collection, and to be able to share it with you today. While I wasn't very impressed with the Annex build, the main part of the castle was pretty darn good. I especially like the interiors, including the trophy room, and the office of the evil Dolores Jane Umbridge. There were also some really cool elements, including the axes inside the entrance hall, the Lego Scala perfume bottles, and the printed mandrake heads, we actually got two of those. Also really cool were the Thestrals. I definitely prefer these to the newer versions. But stealing the show and making this super desirable to collectors like me was the minifigures. There were some oddball choices, for example Malfoy, but it was great to get a Harry Potter who doesn't appear in a million other sets, and the professors included in this set were top notch. I was super excited to get Professor Umbridge because she's such a cool minifigure, and she's also hugely collectible. But I think my favourite from the set has to be Professor Snape. I really like the facial print, and I think this looks very, very close to the character in the movie. So overall, a very, very cool set indeed, and now I have to find somewhere to put it. As they say, that's a really nice problem to have. I really hope you enjoyed this classic LEGO Harry Potter review video as much as I did making it. If you did, a thumbs up is always appreciated, and don't forget to subscribe for more awesome LEGO content. Also, if you're stuck indoors, do check out some other videos from my channel. There's a whole playlist of classic LEGO Harry Potter sets at the end of the video. As always, please feel free to leave your thoughts and comments in the comment section below, but be aware that Professor Umbridge may be moderating some of the comments. Thanks a million for checking out today's review, stay safe, stay inside, keep washing those hands, and I'll see you on the next build video!